Psalm 107 is a, is a Thanksgiving song. See if you notice when things are, are repeated or there's repetition here. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those He redeemed from the hand of the foe, those He gathered from the lands, from the east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. For He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and in deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains. For they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So He subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. For He breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and He saved them from their distress. He sent forth His word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of His works with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, His wonderful deeds in the deep. For He spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and He guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt Him in the assembly of the people and praise Him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into a desert flowing springs into thirsty ground and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who live there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them and their numbers greatly increased and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste, but he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. So if you notice at the beginning, there's a summons here. At the very beginning there, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those He redeemed from the hand of the foe. It's calling, calling to us. This is a call to the redeemed to give thanks. It's a call to those of us who are believers. Those of us who put our trust in. In the Lord, it summons us, it calls us. So if Jesus Christ is your Lord today, then this is talking to you. Give thanks to the Lord because of all that He has done. We're talking about Thanksgiving today and the importance of Thanksgiving in in our prayers. And uh, I was reading some books on on prayer to prepare for this and some uh, one... Author Tim Keller, I've mentioned him a couple times before. 
Uh, he said thanksgiving is a subcategory of praise. Last week, the challenge was to just praise God. Don't ask God for anything, just praise. See what happens. And thanksgiving is a subcategory of praise. To give God thanks is to praise Him. It's to acknowledge that the good things that we have, what we enjoy, actually come from Him. And so it's, thanksgiving is a way of giving God the praise and the honor and glory. So I wanted to throw that, that out there. And giving thanks is really a, a knee-jerk response from true faith. When, when we have true faith in the Lord and we know who He is and our trust is in Him, then we can't help but give thanks. Actually, I was reading and Romans 1 came to my attention. And it says, and it talks about how there's kind of this descent into sin that humanity has here. And that descent into sin started when they failed to give thanks. This is in your Bible reading tracks this week. If you, if you read that, I want you to notice the, the progression downward and how it started by them saying they knew God, but didn't glorify Him or give thanks to Him. And then it was all downhill from there. This is the beginning of idolatry, is to fail to give thanks. To fail to recognize that what we have is from God. And so idolatry takes root then. And uh, Tim Keller was talking about how not giving thanks is actually kind of like plagiarism. Where let's say you, you wrote a paper for a class at school. And then somebody else found your paper and submitted it as theirs to your class, to your same class. They put they took took your name off it, put your name on, their name on. That's plagiarism. That's very heavily punished in academic circles because it's very dishonest. If we look at the good things that we have in our life and we think that this is us, that's kind of like taking what God has given and produced and putting our name on it. It's dishonest. It's like plagiarism. We need to give thanks to the Lord for all that He's done for us. And so, one more time, at your prayer challenge this week, I want to throw that out there. This isn't going to be mine anyways, so I invite you to join me. No requests, just give thanks this week. It's the week of Thanksgiving, so it's a perfect time for it. Don't, don't ask God for things this week. You can put people before Him, but don't ask Him for anything. Just give thanks. And even when you do put people before Him or your concerns, give thanks to God for how He will answer them already. Give thanks. I like how it says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. That was uh, the opening line there. It's interesting how it says that, that way. It's not food or relief or shelter or protection or deliverance that's good. It's God who's good. So you had these stories in there, in the psalm. And instead of saying, hey, it was good that they were delivered, that they were rescued... It says, no, God is good. The good things that we have ultimately come from God, and so God is therefore good. There's a story in the Bible about King David when he was about to bring, bring some vengeance. And uh, he was going to this, this house of, by the name, guy of the name of Nabal. And he was, he was angry. He was going to bring vengeance on this house because this, this house had cheated him, right? So he goes there. He's on his way. And then the wife of Nabal comes out and offers him a peace offering. And instead of saying, wow, thank you. This is very nice. And, and you kept me from, from taking my own vengeance into my own hands, right? He doesn't say that. He says, praise be to the Lord. Abigail comes and intervenes and yet 
God, he gives God the praise and the thanks for that. All the good things that we experience, they come from God. Even when they come through other people, it's ultimately God who's the source of them. The people who first celebrated this psalm and read it, sung it, the psalms are songs, they would have been people who came out of exile, the exiled people who were returning home. Today we have Jesus Christ and we celebrate Him for giving the thanks that we have. There are four kinds of people. There's four stories in this psalm. Maybe you noticed that when it was being read. Four kinds of people who experienced the salvation of God here. In verses 4 through 9, it talks about people who were desert wanderers. People wandering in the desert and they were about to die. And then they call out to God and He saves them. In verses 10 through 16, it talks about that there were captives in chains people who were prisoners and they called out to God and He rescued them from their chains. In verses 17 through 22, it talks about people who had some mortal illness. They were on the edge of death. They were on their deathbed. And then they call out to God and He saves them. He intervenes. And then maybe the most dramatic one is at the end, uh, verses 23 through 32, There were sailors in a storm. I love how it talks about that they were way up in the heavens and they were crashing down into the depths because of how large the waves were. And it says their strength melted away. When you are seeing those kind of waves, your your courage and your strength melts away. You call out to God because you have nothing else. And God saved them. He stilled the storm to a whisper. In each case, they call on the Lord and He saves them. Notice, I asked you to look for some repetition in the passage here. Verses 6, 13, 19, and 28 are almost identical. There's a recurring refrain there. They call on the Lord and He saves them from their distress, their trouble. When there's a refrain here, that means it's a key point. They called on the Lord in their trouble and He saved them. So this is the point here that's trying to be driven home. We call on the Lord and He saves us. He delivers us. In each case also, they were at their wit's end. They were at the end of their rope. And then they turned to God. They, they, had, they exhausted their resources and everything that they could do, and then all they had left was to, to turn to God, and they did. It's interesting how so often we have to hit rock bottom before we're humble enough to surrender. We have to be at the end of all of our resources and at the end of our rope. Then we'll call on God. Then we'll ask Him for help. But usually, if we can still do something about it, we might have a token prayer to God about it, but there's not really that surrender. God, I am yours here. I've got nothing. This is all you. I mean, it's all Him all the time anyways, but there's always that point where we have nothing left and all we have is God. And it's that, that, those moments when we surrender the most. There was a pastor friend of mine who had a, had a pretty rough life. He walked the road of drugs and alcohol and, and partying. And uh, he was in that life for quite a few years. And then there was a moment where he said he hit rock bottom. He was in a homeless shelter and he had no more money, he, would, he had no more access to any of his substances that he was abusing, and he was just miserable. And he was vomiting, he was sick, and he was in this homeless shelter, and he said, and at that moment, I cried out to the Lord. And at that moment, 
was when his life turned around. He had to hit rock bottom. Being on a, on a cement floor in a homeless shelter, puking his guts out and miserable because of the withdrawals that he was going through. Then he cried out to the Lord. There's a saying that goes around a lot that we as Christians will sometimes say, and it goes something like this. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And uh, just want to throw that out there. that That's not in the Bible anywhere at all. In fact, the reverse is true. God regularly gives us more than we can handle, but not more than he can handle. That's what this psalm is all about. In each of these four stories, these people were going through something that was way beyond them to handle. They had nothing left. All they had was God. And they cry out to God, and He saves them. There's all these kinds of stories in the Bible, too. There's no way, in no human way, that David could have beat Goliath. No way. There's no way that Gideon's 300 would overcome countless Midianites. There's no way. There's no way that Peter could have walked on water on his own. And when Jesus said to his disciples when there were 5,000 just men there, and he says, you give them something to eat, and they said, well, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. There's no way they could have fed everybody. God gives us stuff that we can't handle all the time. But he doesn't give us more than he can handle. And I don't know why God gives us, puts us in those situations all the time. Sometimes we do stupid things and we suffer the consequences for it. Sometimes we're, we're doing pretty good and then we just, something, something comes out of nowhere and, and hits us. Sometimes it's not because we do something wrong. But I do believe that when we are at the end of our rope, this is when we grow the most spiritually. It's because that's when we realize that we need God. We can't do it on our own. And this is what we have. God is what we have. He is the one that we need to call to. We need to call on him all the time. But it's only at those moments when we realize who we really depend on. And it's not us. So those moments, those are really rough moments, of course. But those are the moments when we realize that God is all we have and God is all we need. When it's more than you can handle, cry out to God. Because God is mighty to save. We have four stories of it here. And I hope that all of you can tell some stories about this too. God is mighty to save. He's mighty to save then and He's mighty to save today. And that you might not be on a ship and in a storm or, or anything like that or may not be a prisoner in chains, but maybe you have some bad habits that are consuming you. God is mighty to save. Maybe there's shame that you deal with and it's like a rock on your heart. God is mighty to save. Or maybe you have fear that you deal with and that is just keeping you hiding and running. God is mighty to save. Now God is not magic. God doesn't magically save at our command. That's not how he works. That's how demons work. When you say incantations and mixed potions and stuff like that, then they have to obey you. God doesn't work like that. God doesn't always save as we would like. God answers out of his love and grace, not at our command. God is loving and he's gracious. And so when we come to him in prayer, we rest upon that, that he is loving and gracious. It's not our fancy words. It's not saying the right things so that we, he'll do what we want him to do. It doesn't work like that. God is merciful, he's loving, and he's gracious. So when we come to him, we appeal to those things. God, you are loving. So please, please hear me when I pray. 
There's uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Paul talks about, there was given me this thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. And, and God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So God didn't take that thorn away from Paul. But his grace was still there and it was still sufficient. Or when Christ was in Gethsemane. Father, if you are, if you are willing, if it is, everything is possible for you, please take this cup from me. But not as I will, as you will. He still had to go to the cross. The prayer wasn't answered as he would have wanted it. God doesn't always do exactly what we want. But he is loving and gracious. And he answers out of his love and grace. And I'm more and more convinced that God responds to us most when we are humble before him. When we are just humbling ourselves. In our classes right now, the regional group of churches in the Christian Reformed Church, that there's Classes Zealand. We've had a number of difficult moments recently. We've had a number of cases where pastor and church were at odds, and then we go through what we call an Article 17, which is basically a divorce. And we've had enough of these to the point where we are like, we need to start praying. And so at our classes meetings now, we've started spending like just 20 minutes just praying. And then the next meeting, we're talking about doubling that to 40 minutes, just praying. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord. We need to recognize that it's not about our intelligence, our skills. It's not about being clever, or having the right solutions. It's about throwing yourself before God and saying, God, I am yours. Please help. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. God responds to our, our humility out of his love and grace. If we think that we can do it, then when he does help us, it's easy to attribute it to us. Some of you are old enough to remember the first Gulf War in 1991. I remember seeing on the news how many people were praying because of that, because it was supposed to be a very bloody war. People were talking about how it was going to be the next Vietnam, and it was going to be a mess, and it was going to be awful. And so people were praying. There was prayer in schools then. And then when it was quickly over, and it was a rousing success. I didn't hear a lot of people thanking God after that. I heard a lot of praise for the cleverness of our generals, the bravery of our military, and the advances in our technology that we had. But I didn't hear many people say thank you to God. When we think that we can do it, then we can take credit for it when God answers us. And we can plagiarize his good work. Let's look at this screen here. Oops. Did I not put that on there? Oh no, I did it again. Oh man, I will just say this to you. Why did Christ command us to call God our Father in the Lord's Prayer? And the answer is, At the very beginning of our prayer, Christ wants to kindle in us what is basic to our prayer, a childlike awe and trust that God, through Christ, has become our Father. Our fathers do not refuse us the things of this life. God, our Father, will even less refuse to give us what we ask in faith. God is our Father, and He is going to be a Father to us. And so even though we... As parents, we are imperfect. Even the best of us are not perfect parents. We still know how to give good gifts to our kids. How much more will our perfect Heavenly Father give us what we need? God doesn't give us what we want all the time, but He does give us what we need. And the refrain here, 
one refrain, or there's two really, but this other one, the refrain for each is the call to thank the Lord. And there's these four verses that are absolutely identical. Verses 8, 15, 21, and 31 are all exactly the same. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. When you emerge on the other side of trouble, give thanks to God. Don't praise your talents. Don't praise how strong you are. Don't praise how smart you are. Don't attribute it to that. Give thanks to God. He's the one who delivered you. Our strength can fail. Our intelligence can take a day off. God is always there. There's a book that I read not long ago. Um, It's called Lone Survivor. It's by Marcus Luttrell. And uh, he was a Navy SEAL. There were four of them. And they were on this mission in Afghanistan. And they were ambushed by hundreds of Taliban. And he was the only one who survived. His, uh, his three, three friends, they, they all died. And he talks about the whole battle and what happened there. And his theology isn't the best, but there's, there's a few times in here when he recognizes that there's no other explanation that I'm alive today except that God was there. So I have a, just a couple things here. When he was falling down the mountain... He was, he was on this mountain. He was trying to escape the Taliban. They were surrounding him, and so he had to continually fall down, and it was steep. So he would fall far. And his rifle always landed right next to him, within reach, he said. He said, that rifle had so far fought three separate battles in three different places, been ripped out of my grasp twice, been blown over a cliff by a powerful grenade, fallen almost 900 feet down a mountain and was still somehow right next to my outstretched hand. Fluke, believe what you will, my own faith will remain forever unshaken. And then a little later he said this, God had somehow saved me from a thousand AK-47 bullets on this day. No one had shot me, which was well nigh beyond all comprehension. When you emerge on the other side of trouble, notice God. Don't notice how clever you are, how lucky you are. Notice how God delivered you. It's only when we're at the end of our rope that we can't credit salvation to ourselves anymore. Call out to God and give thanks to Him when He delivers you. In verses 33 through 35, it just goes on and on about how God is in control of, of nature and the events of things. It talks about His sovereignty. Our God is able to both humble and exalt according to what our faith needs. Sometimes we get a little puffed up, a little too sure of ourselves, a little too confident, and God has a way of calming us down a little bit. And there's other times when we're kind of low and discouraged and God has ways of which we get picked up and encouraged. So in my case, for example, there's times when I'm working on a sermon throughout the week and I think, wow, I got, I got a lot of good points here and I got some good illustrations and, and this is going to be a great sermon. And, and then at the end, I, didn't, I don't hear anybody say anything about it. It's like, oh yeah, it was fine. And then there's other times when I think, oh, this sermon's kind of all over the place. I don't really have any good explanations for things, no good illustrations. And, oh, but this is what I have. I'm just going to go with it. God, this is what you gave me during the week, so I'm just going to give this sermon. And those are the times when I get the most positive feedback. God has a way of lifting us up and calming us down. That God is fully sovereign over all creation. In the catechism here, it says, Why the words in the Lord's Prayer? Why do we say, Our Father in heaven? These words teach us not to think of God's earthly majesty as something, heavenly majesty as something earthly. 
and to expect everything for body and soul from his almighty power. We are to expect everything for body and soul from his almighty power. So he is mighty to save. So when we consider God's sovereignty, we must also consider his love. That's how it ends. That's the last verse. It talks about how we need to consider the great love of the Lord. It's interesting how when we look at our lives, or when people in general look at their lives, and you run into these really awful things, these really terrible events, and usually that's when God comes into the picture, when the bad things happen. Why would God let this happen? When there's good things happening, it's usually about us. We usually take credit for it. Or we're usually just sailing nicely through life, Everything's going well. We don't think about God as much. But it's usually when it's bad, then we think about God. So what's up with that? Why would we attribute the bad things in life to God and the good things in life to us? That's kind of backwards, isn't it? Because it's really our fault that there's sin in the world. And it's God who overcomes it. Particularly in Jesus Christ when he died on the cross for us. Because only divine love would go to the cross for sinners. Our love would not do that. We don't have that much love that we would ever make that kind of a sacrifice. Only God's power could overcome sin And only God's love would save us from sin. So let's always give thanks for our greatest gift. And that is God's love in Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let the redeemed give thanks. If you are redeemed, give thanks to the one who saves you has saved you, does save you, will save you. And let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and spirit, which reminds us of who you are and encourages us, gives us truths to live by. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you save us and deliver us and encourage us We look forward to how you will continue to do that. And so, Lord, we put our trust in you as the one who loves us enough to send your own son to die in our place so that we might be saved. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.